let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the OKD Working Group meeting for March 29th of 2022. And let's take a quick look at the agenda there. And if there's anything that was missed, uh, please let me know or, or add it in there. Um, let's see if we have any new folks. Um, any new folks who want to introduce themselves? Uh, I see one or two names that I don't recognize. No pressure, but if you want to introduce yourself, feel free. All right, well then let's uh, move on to our first agenda item, which is uh, the OKD release updates. Um, Christian is not here today. Uh, Vadim is taking a hiatus from OKD. And so um, basically Christian um, sent me some info that um, basically there's a blocker um, and uh, I have a link to it up there. Um, and this is for the 4.10 uh, release. And as soon as they can get past that, uh, then we will um, have a solution uh, to that. And uh, it looks like this issue here might be related to it. So that um, um, but uh, basically, um, Uh, within that link. Yeah, okay, so that is the link, actually, that first link. So basically, um, if you go in there, you'll find some stuff related to the ongoing issue for um, OKD 410. And we'll be talking more about that um, at the next meeting. The docs group is just sort of getting things settled where um, we'll have multiple people with access to the Twitter and be able to tweet out things like new releases and, and whatnot. Um, it's just a question of everyone having the same Bitmorton setup uh, to share the credentials for Twitter. Um, but we'll talk about that in the um, docs updates. Uh, is anyone from the FCOS, any Red Hat folks from FCOS here? Uh, doesn't look like it. Um, so uh, I guess we can go to the docs update. Brian, go ahead. Um, I wasn't at the last docs meeting. I, I was ill, so I'm not sure there's anything happened there. What I can say is I've moved the charter into the OKD.io docs. Um, I put a new items list in the repo. Um, so we'll talk about how we want to sunset the rest of that content. There is a roadmap in there, and there is a member, and there are membership lists in that repo. And I don't know whether we still want to do those or um, keep them up to date or just drop them. So we'll talk about that there. But in terms of the um, the charter, the charter as it now stands is in the OKD.io docs in the community section. Um, I am still working with Brandon to get some styling updates added. Um, he's done some tweaks on basically the CSS style sheet just to update some colors and to, to make the site a little bit easier to read and improve accessibility. Um, so I'm not sure whether he's gonna do a pull request on those or he's gonna wait until he's done any further styling, but I'll, I'll catch up with him this week. Um, yeah, there was um, some people have commented there, there has been a discussion group about site stability. Um, and this is down to GitHub because OKD.io is now hosted by GitHub. It's on the GitHub pages and we just um, redirect the OKD.io um, URL to the GitHub pages um, site. And GitHub have been having a number of issues. Um, apparently they're having, they're having some database issues which cause the outage and I put a link in the um, MK into the um, HackMD minutes where there is a blog from GitHub 
discussing the issues they've been having over the last few weeks. The site has been stable for over a week now, so I think whatever the issues were, GitHub seemed to be getting on top of it again. Okay, so it wasn't related to build. Someone had thought it was related to builds, No, no, it, it, it was nothing to do with us. It was purely the GitHub's pages environment was down. So every site hosted by GitHub was down for a while. Um, and I noted that there was some repo at about the same time. I had some repo issues where you couldn't access repo. So it was purely a GitHub issue. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for docs. Um, Dusty did pop in to talk about FCOS stuff real quick. He's only got a few minutes, so let's uh, pass the, the talking stick over to Dusty real quick uh, to talk about FCOS stuff, uh, and then we'll switch back to maybe Docs after that. So, Dusty, take it away. Gotcha. Yeah, I didn't know if we uh, had any specific questions. A um, couple things to call out, just uh, happenings in the community. Um, our next stream in Fedora CoreOS is now uh, on Fedora 36. Um, so the beta for Fedora 36 came out today, and uh, we've been testing on NextDevel for a few weeks, uh, running that through CI. So hopefully, you know, people don't find issues, but if they do, at least they may, you know, we found them before they reached our uh, other streams. Um, so I don't know. Uh, what the team and Christian have set up now for, you know, testing future streams, uh, but that might be something to look at. Um, and then one other thing, uh, Jamie, I know, I think you run some VMware, don't you? Um, we are updating our VMware images to use UEFI and Secure Boot by default. Um, and that is happening uh, on our next and testing streams this go round, and then it'll happen in stable in two weeks. Um, we also have some documentation that we're working on. I don't know if it's published yet. That will show you how to essentially go back in and, and edit the, the image if you, for some reason, need to stay on um, BIOS boot. Uh, that's it for me as far as updates. I don't know if we had any specific questions. Uh, from the Fedora for OS perspective. I thought that the, the FCOS, FCOS image um, production process actually produces hybrid boot images, that they do both UEFI and BIOS. So, because like that's how it is for the KVM images, if I remember correctly. So, I'm a little confused why that's not being done for the other ones. I think the OVAs themselves have metadata in them that specify like what this image prefers. And okay. we're, upda we're updating that to say default to UEFI and secure boot. Okay, so the actual content of the disk image inside of the OVA is still hybrid, but the metadata that is associated with it for the OVA is what's changing. That is my understanding, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, so but the reason, I, the reason I ask that clarification is that at work, I deal with some VMware for some things that I pretend to hope I don't have to care about very much, but it's a thing. Mm -hmm. And um, some versions of VMware ESXi straight up ignore the value that's set in the OVA metadata and will just always do one mode or the other depending on what bug is affecting the, the, uh, the ESXi or vSphere software at this point in time. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm concerned because if if the actual disk doesn't have both parts, then if the field is being ignored for some reason, that the image won't boot, and there's no clear way to actually fix it. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that it, it supports both because um, for the most part, our images on different platforms are mostly uh, just the same bits, just repackaged in a different way. Because um, different for different platforms take different inputs, like. I think GCP takes a tarball and, you know, some take a QCOW and some take a VHD and some take an OVA. Uh, but nine times out of ten, like, there's nothing, you know, as far as when you boot the machine, uh, there's no changes between the different platforms other than a platform ID that gets embedded. All right. So, Neil, it should, you know, because uh, 
obviously we can boot on either or uh, for other platforms. It should work as well on VMware if you if you tried to go in and override that to go back to BIOS. Okay, cool. That's all I really care about is just, not that I want people using BIOS, but I'm already aware of vSphere and ESXi versions where this, there are bugs in VMware where it doesn't read the metadata value properly and will do one thing or the other, regardless of what you tell it. And so I would just rather that actually work regardless. Cool. Yeah, if you have access to one of those environments, uh, go grab our testing or next um, VMware image. You can you should be able to grab those on the web page today and uh, and see if they work. I will I will ask to see if I can. I will make no promises, but but all I know is I know that this is a problem because I've been bitten before, and I just wanted to ask to make sure. Cool. Yeah, we always uh, yeah we always welcome that feedback just because it's hard to know everything, <laughs> so we only know what people tell us. Jamie, I can't hear you. I don't know. How about now? Yes, okay. I can hear you now. Any questions or comments for Dusty related to Fedora Core OS side of the house? Anything? Awesome. Well, thanks, Dusty. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you popping in like this yep. uh, just uh, on the spur of the moment. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I... Uh... I was planning to cover today, but I, I got busy with some other things, so sorry. No, um, no yep. problem at all. I'll see you all later. All right, take care. All right, let's bounce back to Doc's stuff. Um, so one of the things that came out of the, the Doc's meeting is the need for a contributor's guide and a guide on the infrastructure. Uh, like the actual infrastructure behind the builds. The reason for this is something that I alluded to earlier in the meeting, that Vadim has de decided to take a um, hiatus from working on OKD. So right now, the, there's Christian contributing when he can, but that's it. We can put in bug fixes and um, code changes and whatnot and get them approved by Christian and a handful of other folks so we can contribute still. Um, but there's really, um, there's no guide for sort of how things work in the background. And, and you know, Brian has riffed on this quite a bit. Um, you know, there's nothing to say what the infrastructure is in the background very clearly or what is the path to being a contributor? At the docs meeting, Diane suggested following um, sort of a, a stepped approach to contributions. So just like in Kubernetes or some of the other projects, you know, you, you get a badge basically after so many of certain types of contributions that allow you um, to step up to make more sort of fundamental contributions. Um, that's something that the docs group will talk about. Is, does anyone have any feedback on those ideas? Any thoughts on this? You know, this was Jamie, all of a sudden, uh, the morning of the docs meeting, he, he sort of left the channel and um, said he's going on hiatus. So it was kind of sudden. Okay, yeah, Jamie, um, yeah, I have been quite vocal on this. I think one of the, one of the challenges is before anybody can start contributing, they have to be able to do a build and do a local test because nobody really wants to push anything or no one should want to push anything and do a pull request until they've at least checked that their code compiles right. and hopefully works. And my problem is I don't know how to do that and I don't know whether I can do that or whether OKD is so integrally linked with the Red Hat build system, the Prow system that runs internally with Red Hat but I'm not sure how to go. And there is the, the 600 odd repos in the OpenShift organization. So just trying to find out which repos I actually need to care about to actually work out how to do a build. I've tried to go down the sort of, the, 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 the sort of um, maze before and you just end up going round and round circles and getting totally lost. I'd love to be able to do an OKD build, um, but 
even things like, are we still in Vadim's repo for the special OKD sort of process? Vadim had that in his personal repo for a while. There was talk about it moving into the OpenShift repo again. So I don't think anybody outside Red Hat really understands or has the ability to understand how to do a build, if it's possible to do a build outside of the Red Hat infrastructure. And if so, what is the end-to-end -end process flow? So I, I think it'd be really good to actually try and get that at least documented. I'm quite happy to write things up, but I need some guidance. I need someone to walk me through it so I can actually right. um, then document it. I think it depends on what you mean by a build. Um, you know, I built I built my own images for the last year. You know, for testing, um, you have to realize that OKD, you know, and OpenShift are built with a wide variety of modules, and each of those modules kind of has its own build process. They're kind of similar, but ninety nine percent of the time, you don't need to rebuild those. You just go out there and you access the ones that are currently out there and, and currently built. Um, so it's more of how do you build a particular module, say, you know, um, OKD Machine OS, um, and how do you integrate that uh, into your own image to test with? Um, it's not a hard process for that particular one. Um, it's, it's honestly, it's not even convoluted. Um, but what you probably do need uh, is your own repository out on, uh, uh, not GitHub, um, or Docker Hub. I just went right out of my head. Where all the images are currently Key. stored. Key. <clears throat> Key.io. Yes. Uh, so, you know, you need to have your own repository there that you can push out these images, and then you build a complete image and you push it out, and then you can actually do an install from that secondary image. Um, you know, is it going to look exactly like what you what we're currently doing with all the dates and everything? No, and you know there's probably details that we can get from Vadim on that, you know, to help with the process. But for debugging and building, uh, it's really not that not that difficult. It's just not well documented. Yeah, so I can I can probably speak to this from front to back, depending on where you want to start. But like, I pretty much agree with what John's saying. Like, I, I don't think it's good to advise like OKD community members to try and build an entire release image on there. That, that's going to be like boiling the ocean. And like, what you're going to have to do is basically fork the OpenShift release repo, set up your own prow system, and then allow, because that's how we build the release images now, is we use all that prow automation to build the individual images, we put them through testing, and then we promote them into release images. And this is kind of where, you know, Vadim is, is in taking the inspiration for cutting the OKD images off. So like, so, and this is, yeah, go ahead, Jamie. Well, I just, I've, let me add a little bit more context. One of the things that came up in the docs meeting was, Diane is actually going to check into what is what are the ramifications of making OKD a truly external open source project. So if, it's this isn't necessarily in terms of users building it, but the community, the community. building yeah, it yeah. and maintaining it. Yeah, sure. Right, right. Well, yeah. and so I'm trying to get to the point of like what you originally said about like making changes, and then you know Brian was talking about well you you know you probably want to test your changes before you do anything. So like, it, what I my point here is that like, yeah, I think if the OKD community wants to grow to the point where they're doing, they've got like their own prow system that's building everything, like that's, you know, that's awesome and whatnot, right? Like all that code is still gonna go back to the OCP stuff unless OKD becomes a full fork, right? And then there's like no, sub, there's no linkage between the OKD code repositories and the upstream or downstream, I guess, is the way we look at it. OCP repositories, right? So like we're working with partners to help them do these kind of things now from the Red Hat side. And the way we do it is exactly like John was just talking about now. So like the entry way to get into testing your things is learning how to build an image for the component you're working on, a container image, right? And then using the OC ADM tooling to build a release image from a known good OKD image that has your component image inserted into it. 
And so like, to me, that's the level one process you want to get to. Once you, once you know how to create like a component image that you're working on, let's say you're working on machine config operator, right? So I've got my repo. I know how to build an image. I know how to put it into key or quay, depending on which side of the pond you're from. And then I know how to build a release image that points to my image in the registry, right? And so now I've got that all bundled up and I've made sure that the internals look good so it'll it'll match the image when I deploy it. Just getting to that step alone is a really big accomplishment. But once you get there, you can do what John's talking about where you can build your own release image that has your component in it and now you can at least test it before you put it up to you know the upstream. And then the and next step would be like, okay, yeah. learning how to do that for each component and building a full release image. But I think for a contributor, just get like, if we had guidance of how they could take a currently released OKD image, use the OC tooling to replace one of the components, that would probably get people started at least on this process of contributing. And honestly, that's how I do my testing. You know, we identify a bug, you know, whether it was MCO, you know, back a year ago or OKD Machine OS or whatever. Um, that's how I do it. And then I build it on my local environment and test. Cause honestly, it's faster than going through CI. Um, <laughs> it's so, it's so much easier to go through and iterate the, you, know, you know, over an hour than it is over four hours waiting for CI to do a test. Um, you know, and then once you have some confidence in it, yes, I'm only testing mm -hmm. VMware, you know, a lot of changes have to go through and, you know, go on OpenStack and, you know, all the other things. Um, but at least you have some confidence that at least, you know, in one environment it runs and builds and then CI can test it, hopefully, wherever else it has to do. Part of the issue we have right now, especially with OKD Machine OS, um, is that right now it can only, you can't build it from a pull from another user account. So if I create something, I have a forked build, um, and, I, and then I want to do a pull, it won't work because of how OKD Machine OS is currently built with um, Vadim's magic. Um, he has some magic that happens in there. So the only way that you can build is if you have actual access to the direct repository outside of a build. You can still do a pull, but you have to have real access to it, um, not um, not from a fork. So that's that's one of the issues that we have is that somebody has to be able to control it. Right now, I think it's only Vadim and Christian, although I, I could be wrong. I haven't looked at the uh, the owner's side very much, but um, that's a, it's not really a flaw, but that's a, a disadvantage of how we're currently building, because um, that's how, you know, we're building the images for FCOS and adding all the other magic that happens uh, that differentiates us from using um, our HCOS. Um, so there's some discussion that has to happen in there if you don't have build authority in that repo. Yeah. Now, and one of the things that came up is that OKD is now theoretically a true upstream of OpenShift. So that might change the dynamics a little bit in terms of what Red Hat's thought might be about our spinning off and and how those any fixes we would make would end up back in um, OCP, right? Like they might be reluctant to relinquish it now because we are a true upstream or they so, might be really happy to do that because there'll be innovation if there's a lot of developers working on it. Are they talking about completely forking it? Because right now we have the exact same, except for OKD Machine OS, my understanding right now is that we are completely on the same code base. We could yeah. build in ex So that would have to fork everything if we're gonna be completely upstream. Or if we flip it the other, we flip it on its head, right? The, the other way to think about this is the existing process shifts to being more in the public view, the one that actually runs right now that builds the OCP slash OKD whatevers. Um, and if if we're saying, okay, we're we're tracing all this, we're already okay with the contents that the, the, the little, the literal binary blobs that make up the different container images that are the unbranded bits are identical, then we 
take the bits that actually have like the branding, the the integration bits. So that's MCD, uh, web console container, and I think like two others out of like the 360 odd containers that actually make up OpenShift. Um, those get splintered. One you get that is OCP built internally and one you get OKD built publicly. And then the rest of them just happen publicly in one built process. Uh, because doing that, flipping that, because right now we're sister builds. We're not, the, like, the truth is we're sister builds and the way Red Hat does it is that they promote at their own pace rather than following the train that we do now. If we keep that model, which I think is actually a really good model, then we can minimize what kind of splitting we actually have to do architecturally for um, motivate making this more of a community platform, right? So if we shift what we're already doing from inside the Red Hat farm to outside the Red Hat farm, and then we take the bits that actually have to be different and split their processes so there is one inside the Red Hat side and one outside the Red Hat side, then uh, we don't wind up boiling the ocean, I think, like two or three times for no particularly great reason. Uh, and it maximizes the value to the OCP team and minimizes the, um, the uh, um, how do I say this, responsibility or, or, or pressure or onus on the OKD side. Uh, and, and that, I think, is probably what we want to move towards because I, I think we basically want to emulate without the bad parts, the way that RHOSP is handled right now, which is you've got the RDO stuff, that's all being built essentially once, and then uh, Red Hat promotes internally at their own pace because uh, otherwise it just turns into madness because it's like hundreds of components that need to be recycled through and it's just like, Nobody want nobody on this planet wants to boil the oceans faster, <laughs> so let's not let's not do that if we don't have to. So part of this is like you know Neil, I don't disagree with what you're saying, you know, but I think there's like a really complicated part of this, and just you know to push back on the notion, you know, Jamie, you're saying OKD is a is an upstream, but I think like that. If that is kind of like what the community thinks, that messaging is certainly not happening internally at Red Hat. And I think that there's a big disconnect here. And, you know, I love the notion of OKD becoming the pure upstream and us building a model, you know, like RHOSP or like Fedora or something like that, where it's like we can consume down. But there are architectural decisions that are being made inside Red Hat right now mm -hmm. about the core structuring of OpenShift and how it will change going forward. And some of this has to do with our plans on, you know, what, what we're gonna do with OpenShift as a product going forward, right? And so I think that it's disingenuous to the community right now to say that there's even any sort of upstream notion because there is no forum whereby the community is having input on these like, you know, kind of big design decisions that are being made. And I would expect that if we ever get to the point, and I hope we do, where OKD is seen as the upstream to OCP's downstream, I would expect these decisions to be happening in an open forum that's, you know, curated by the community. And right now, that's just simply not possible. And, you know, just to be blunt about it, because no this is Red Hat's product and it's making a lot of money right now. Yeah. So, this like, is, this is a this is a money. It's a big right deal, now. right? Yeah, so it's a very big deal. And so like, there's no way that these architectural decisions could be moved outside of the Red Hat fence at the moment, right? Not while things are in flight like this. So like, yeah. I would expect that like, at some level, o the OKD community coming together to start building a mirror of the build process that's happening internally, that might be the natural course here. And then at some point, there could be a discussion about like, okay, is there a way that we move the fader over more towards the community side where we have confidence that there is a prow configuration happening the same way that we do internally? And now can we start to model what it would look like to have the community doing this? But like, as far as where I'm sitting, I haven't heard any of these discussions internally about like moving to like a community model or OKD being upstream, you know, maybe that's happening around what, who Diane's talking with and whatnot. But like it hasn't percolated to the engineers yet. Yeah, I, not I only that, that, but who's going to pay for the community prowl? Because right, right now it's all right. being it's all being paid for by Red Hat, and that is not going to be cheap. 
It is not cheap. So, it is definitely yeah. somebody is going. I mean, I I can't pay for it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely you know, can't. Yeah, there is I, no community funding that I'm aware of. You know, that would allow us to go through and do something like that. You know, we're, yeah. we're not Kubernetes. You know, we don't have you know that um, support. So I, I, you know, and you know, the jaded part of me is saying, hey, y'all are owned by IBM now. You guys are a profit center. They're not going to give that away. Right. Brian, and, I see you have of, something, and then Daniel, you had something as well. So Brian, then yeah. Daniel. Sorry, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, I think let's do what, what's achievable. So we know there are bits of OKD that are different. We've talked about getting an OKD catalog for what are currently the licensed operators. So that's different. We do have some differences in branding. So there are some differences where we do have a different, we're based on Fedora. So there are bits of it where we own our own destiny in terms of those little pieces. And I think if we start there, we can then set up something working. And then I, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, Red Hat is very vocal about its open source credentials. And I think this could test those because at the minute, I mean, OpenShift isn't really an open source project. There is no governance outside of Red Hat. So I, I think there are some discussions to be had primarily within Red Hat initially. Um, and then wherever those discussions lead, we're sort of beholden to them. Um, and we can't really do anything until those discussions have been taken at senior level within Red Hat. But there are bits we can certainly do. I'm very keen to try and get this operator thing up and running. Um, it, both our community catalog is broken currently because the community catalog that gets shipped with OKD has dependencies on the registry at Red Hat operators that are missing. So, for example, I can't put the, the, the community CHE operator on OKD because it's looking for the terminal um, operator that's part of the licensed Red Hat registry. So, without a a pull secret and pulling that operator, I can't even put, put the community CHE version on. So there are things like that, that I think that we can own our destiny and we can actually make progress on. And I think we should focus on those. And then we, in the background, we, we, we let the discussions around what's going on within Red Hat to go on and then we'll pick up whatever those discussions produce. Yeah. I, uh, I'll yeah. let Daniel go. Yeah. So I'd just like to propose to the Red Hatters, um, one of the ways this could go is the same way CentOS Stream went, where it's Red Hat controlled, but it's out in the open enough that the community has some level of participation. And just like Red Hat is, I, I mean, Red Hat Linux is, is, obviously a huge money maker, but CentOS Stream still makes sense as a collaboration model. I think that's one of the ways we could do this for the same reason. Um, and, I, you know, for what it's worth, I don't participate a lot in OKD compared to a lot of you, but I personally would be okay giving up some amount of control over OKD's destiny if the result was that we and Red Hat were aligned in moving in the same general direction. Uh, I'm I'm curious to hear other people's perspectives on that, but so, I just wanted to point that out for other for for Red Hatters who are talking about this internally. So this is pretty much the reason why I said that we probably want to focus on instead of having a conversation of how to replicate the whole infrastructure, let's. Uh, the the I think the the strongest and easiest thing to do internally for Red Hatters is to have a conversation about moving the prow that builds OCP, the the, in, the infrastructure that actually does that, out of the firewall, and and then splitting the bits that actually, like, the when you look at all the content that makes up Red Hat OpenShift, and OKD. Let's ex ignore our cause and F cause because those those two bits are already technically independent build infrastructures. All the other stuff that's layered on top of that, 
Most of it is bit for bit identical. We produce the same containers and they get consumed by both sides. Then you have the very small proportion of things. Right now, I think it's MCD, web, the, the OpenShift web console, the API server, and like two other things that are actually fundamentally different because they need to be tweaked specifically to be Red Hat OpenShift container platform versus OKD on FCOS. Like, if you if you consider what actually makes the differences between the two platforms, then the bigger win initially is to try to move the thing that already does the stuff into the public view so that people can see what's happening. And then we can talk about access controls, we can talk about contribution levels, and we can talk about where splits need to be done for stuff that happen that it has to happen internally versus externally. We can do we can talk about how do you deal with um like because then you can the focus point then is dealing with things like okay, you have sensitive OCP errata, you have CVE things, you have non-disclosures and and weird things that vendors do. Um that those need to be done, you know, maybe hidden from view and then later exposed when when things are fine, that sort of stuff. But like duplicating the OpenShift container build. Uh, an OpenShift container platform build infrastructure, I do not think is a productive or, uh, thing. Uh, it is, I don't think it is uh, productive for us to consider going down that path for the working group or anyone as a whole beyond the fact of how can we do a subset of this for the OKD specific parts? Um, because the rest of it is identical and also it's enormous. And frankly, I don't think anyone wants to build all of it. Uh, more than once. Does anyone else want to chime in? Just the, uh, the one thing. The one thing I just want to make sure, though, is obviously Vadim's got his reasons for for, for taking a, a, a step back at the minute. If Christian gets pulled into an internal project, are we going to be left in a state where OKD stops? And I, and I think as a community, we need, need to make sure that, that 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 can't happen. And if that means that somebody from outside Red Hat needs to be able to step in and do the work that Vadim or Christian is doing, assuming they can get the knowledge, I'm aware that those guys have a lot of internal knowledge that we in the community probably don't have. Maybe John, I, I think, is probably one of the more technically advanced in the community. But... Um, I just think as a community, we need to make sure that we're not beholden to a single person, because if that person has to step back for either personal or, or, or job-related issues, we don't want this project to stall. I, th I think that's my concern. Yeah, and I've voiced this before, is that, I mean, Vadim is basically the linchpin in all of this, right? And if Vadim gets abducted by aliens, you know, uh, then we're kind of screwed, right? It's it's we can assume that Red Hat would put someone else in there, but you know um, we don't know. We do know that Red Hat has put some effort into this new operators catalog that's OKD specific. That's a step towards acknowledging that it's OKD is still viable. I think in the eyes of Red Hat because they're putting some engineering. In. Um, but we don't really have any guarantees and no promises. And lots of people, there, as Diane phrased it to me the other day, there have been many Vadims. There have been many people in the in the life cycle of OKD who have stepped into that role and then stepped out because they get promoted. It's basically a, a stepping stone to getting promoted within Red. Um, so it's going to happen. And it's just a question of how, you know, as you said, Brian, like how, how do we fill that? And can it be filled by an external person? Or can we show the value so much that um, that Red Hat very easily puts someone else in um, who's going to do a good job of leading this project, right, from a technical standpoint? It's been said, and I, I, it's probably accurate. I'm not going to mince words about it, but it's likely that Red Hat views OKD as a stepping stone to OCP, to people purchasing OCP licenses. It's like, hey, here's this thing, it's nice. By the way, it's even nicer and stable and supported if you pay for OCP. Many, many organizations have gone that route. 
right? Of playing with OKD, testing it, and then they buy their OCP license. That's um, so, you know, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Um, I just want to uh, comment on what Daniel said a little bit ago. Um, he had mentioned, you know, uh, CentOS uh, streams and stuff. Um, I, <laughs> And this is, you know, I, I kind of felt, you know, really bad after it happened, but after Red Hat changed the whole deal with CentOS, you know, and stuff like that, it left a lot of people with a lot of bad taste in their mouth. I specifically asked when that happened, what's going to happen to OKD? You know, because again, you know, you could look at OKD as being a competitor to OCP. You know, it's free. You know, people can manage it themselves. You know, you look at a lot of the problem tickets, whatever you see online, you can manage a lot of your issues yourself if you have the technical teams to do it. So do you do something with OKD, like make it like um, CentOS Streams, and now make it much harder to use in production because you can't be sure about whether or not things are going to be stable. The biggest issues that we have with stability right now, and I know I've said it before, and you all are probably tired of hearing it, is because of FCOs. And you all, I know you're going to roll your eyes. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but we know, you know, that any OKD issues themselves are probably the same issues that OCP has in terms of the actual product outside of networking and some of the other things. So we have a high level confidence that OKD itself is probably fine. If we go to an upstream version or like Tento Streams or, or you know, something similar to that, my concern is that we will go to a different model of how quickly we do things. And now we're gonna have so many changes, you know, Kind of like we're doing in Fedora between, you know, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, where it's going to make it hard for it to be used in a production type of environment like I'm using it versus a lab or a college or something else where people are learning about OpenShift, you know, technology. So there's my concern um, in terms of, you know, going to a CentOS streams type of model. Um, I understand why Red Hat did it, at least I think I understand why Red Hat did it, um, but it really made the community, the CentOS community unhappy, and now that's why you've got Rocky Linux. I would just, in, in point of fairness, John, like I think, you know, you say it was a Red Hat decision, and I think that's definitely what the popular conception is, but like the decisions that were made were actually made by the CentOS community, or whatever their governing body is, so it wasn't like a dictate that came from yeah, but you, I would say that most of that leadership is were probably red hatters. I mean, I'm not I'm not denying the the closeness between those communities. I'm just I'm just quibbling about semantics. <laughs> I, I no, I understand. And like I said, you know, I was a CentOS user for a long, long, long time. You know, and that kind of you know hit me hard, and it still it still bothers me. Um, but I just I, the reason I say that is because I had mentioned that a year ago or however long ago that this happened that my worry was this was going to happen with OKD and this is the first time that I'm not saying that it's officially been said but the idea has been brought forward you know to model OKD you know like a like you know with CentOS streams and Daniel I, I understand exactly what you're talking you know how you're talking it's not it's just something that I heard that I wanted to express that's fair and to be very clear. I am not a Red Hatter. I have no insight into what Red Hat is planning. So this random idea that I threw out should not be taken as any sort of official direction of anything. Oh, sure, sure. But I just, I'll just i just say no comment. But there are continual discussions inside Red Hat about, like, you know, the best ways to improve OpenShift and kind of the future and whatnot. So, like, you know, I, well, I get what you're saying. And I think, in to me, in an ideal world, what we would want out of a situation like that is kind of like the best of what's coming out of the CentOS streams, you know, thing, which is that streams is like this kind of bleeding edge next rel that's coming and the community can put things in there that will eventually make it into rel. And I would, I, I would well, imagine yeah. that like, For if sure. that's the model that Red Hat wants to use going forward for OpenShift, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, to get, 
OKD at a point where the community is using it out front and putting changes in there that eventually get into OCP, you know, that would be ideal, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't serve you, John. Go ahead, Neil, sorry. So a couple of things I want to quibble since we're now at quibbling points. Um, <laughs> first of all, CentOS stream, not really bleeding edge and not even like Fedora leading edge or any of that sort of thing, right? That, that's it. It's no particularly worse than what happens that you get that RHEL minor release three months, four months, six months from now, right? It, that, that's how that works. Um, the second point of, uh, of order really is uh, we have always been this way, even if we haven't tacitly acknowledged, we haven't really explicitly acknowledged this. The, the CentOS stream model, uh, as it were, is essentially how OKD operates now. We basically take what Red Hat does, we spiff it up with a alternate logo, uh, push it out with a FCOS underneath it instead of an RCOS, and we kind of call it a day. That That's pretty much what's happening now. Um, and the main point of difference between OKD and OCP is that where the version numbers track. So like OKD right now is I think going to be tracking to 4.11 and OCP is just about to track on to 4.10. So we're already in that like, OKD is the next minor version of OCP thing. The, the continual integration of container technologies and such, and especially trying to get more Kubernetes -Z stuff, you know, bettered, has necessitated using FCOS as the base rather than building a CentCos or whatever you want to pervert words into making a, a CentOS version of Corios. Um, like, though that is already today. Um, formalizing that structure makes it easier to make the engagement more positive between Red Hat engineering, Red Hat product management, technical marketing, and the community, because right now the situation is we all just don't talk to each other and we pretend we don't exist. And that's pretty bad. Like being involved in CentOS stream now, like I, I'm, a mem I'm not in Red Hat. I don't know people. I don't know what's going on in the internal discussions, the minutia of what goes on inside of Red Hat. I know some people claim to think I work for Red Hat or do whatever, but I promise you, I never have. I don't even know if it ever will happen, but I can say this much that CentOS Stream, I was one of those people that pushed very hard on the CentOS Stream concept even before it existed. Like when Red Hat acquired the CentOS project to revive it from its like half broken state that it was before, um, it was something that I talked to a lot of Red Hat Enterprise Linux product managers about. Like I want a way for this to be a thing because y'all pushed out two point releases that broke all of my servers uh, because you didn't test AMD stuff enough to make sure that you didn't break them. And I had to like hold back RHEL minor releases and the, the, the faces that they made when I said I had to hold back RHEL minor releases because they, because of, you know, actual faults in the software, I think drove the point home that something like this needed to exist. And when RHEL 9.0 GAs in a month and a half, I think people are going to be surprised at how up to snuff it is immediately out of the door with the collection of Apple, with all the software, with all the hardware testing and all the usage that has happened from having six, six months to a year of existing as CentOS Stream 9 um, ahead of time, right? Like that, that's a huge win that I want to replicate for OpenShift. And I, and that is, I think, where we should move our North Star towards. And I think for Red Hatters, like Elmico and, and others, I think that's a productive point to go towards when you're talking about how in the world we want to make OKD viable, successful, and interesting to Red Hat and the community. I mean, I tend to agree with you, Neil. I tend to agree with you, but like, if those conversations are happening, I, I hope they're happening on Diane's end, because like sadly, they're not happening in the places that I'm hanging out in. 
Well, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground. It sounds like first and foremost, we want a contributor's guide that includes as its first chapter, sort of an overview of the infrastructure and how it works, the build process overall. And then chapter two is our first goal, which it seems like we sort of agreed upon is building components successfully building components and integrating them uh, as being a first step to, to really um, being contributors to it. And so does that sound like a game plan moving forward that the docs working group can start on that next week right. is uh, basically create a template and then start asking questions to fill out that template so that we have a the first two chapters of a contributor's guide? Jimmy, I think I heard that the other way around. I think the, the, the suggestion was the easier option, the easier way in is learn how to build a single component and integrate it into an installation rather than the bigger build picture. Well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean, okay. actually, that that would be, but, but chapter one would be like, what is everything? Like, how is it all connected? Like just sort of an overview of the, of the build process to even know that there is this thing out there that you're taking okay. the whole of and then inserting a component into. Does that make um, sense? I mean, it does make sense. I just dropped a link in chat here because this is a documentation site that we just launched um, that I've been kind of leading the effort for internally. And this is like the documentation that we've been creating over the last you know, six months to a year when we've been onboarding IBM and and uh, Alibaba and whatnot, and this is the documentation that we're gonna that we're starting to show to like Nutanix and others for how they would integrate like core components into OpenShift, like integrating new infrastructure layer components. Um, I don't think it's necessarily specifically related to like the whole notion of the contributor guide, but I think it's another window into the type of activity that someone contributing might want to do. Um, and it's got a lot of links to like PRs from IBM and Alibaba and how they integrated their components. I think it's extra information that would help someone who's really trying to dive deep to understand this. Um, so I just wanted to share it as like one more point to think about as we're maybe assembling a contributor guide. Um, you know, this is more resource and we plan to continue to update those docs with more information about how to, you know, how to put these components in. Um, so, yeah, just forgot I shared that. Excellent. Jamie, I'll put something together. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like, I, I mean, except for Christian, I probably, and obviously Vadim, you know, I've been through this process a couple of times. Um, I'll try to get something maybe in the next week, depending on my on my time, um, at least how to do it. it. may end up being videos because a lot of times videos are just easier to do. But um, if I can, I'll try to drop in on the docs um, meeting next week. With, right, or, or touch like base with me uh, and Brian, uh, Brian and I, uh, and just let us know what you have, and we can shape it into something that we can bring the docs group. And I, I do have yeah. a meeting coming up with Vadim where I'm going to pick mm -hmm. his brain a little bit, so. Yeah, I mean, John, if, if it would make help, make it easier for you. If you want to do a, a demo, we can record that, and then I can turn that into documentation, if that would be easier for you. There you go. Yeah, I mean, it'll probably be a combination of, I mean, like I said, I've gone through this quite a few times. What, I, what I'll probably want to do is take two, like OKD Machine OS and then our, our good old friend um, MCO and build those two. Those are the, the two most interesting for us. But the process is the same for a console or for auth or anything else. You know, there's usually a build file or a make file or something that you run. Then you push the doc image and, you know, the Docker file or container image. So. The process, the high level process is the same. The minutia of each component is a little bit different. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, I'd like to share just... two more links here, if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah. Share, share away, buddy. Share away. Yeah, I haven't looked at that one. So these are some hacking guides for the components yep. that, I, you know, my team directly works on and I work on. Um, the first one is like our new operator. Like, I'll just give you the, the component 
it, the components don't really matter, but that first one is for our new operator that manages the cluster, uh, the cloud controller managers. Mm -hmm. And the second one is for the machine API. But the first one um, has our instructions about like replacing a component inside of the, uh, inside of a release image. So I know John's gonna like demo that and everything, but there's a little pre-canned text for you if you okay. want something to reference to go along with what John's doing. Um, and then the machine API operator one is all about like hacking on the machine API. Uh, that might give you a little insight into how we talk about contributor guides and kind of what we talk about to other people, you know, predominantly redheaders who are contributing to these things. But I figured it, those might be helpful like, as inspiration uh, for what you guys are doing. Yeah. Appreciate you sharing. Fantastic. Well, as you guys noted, there's like 600 repos in there, and this stuff is buried deep in each one of them. And it's like, you know, this is like the Fremen on Arrakis or something. Like, no, no one knows where all the water caches are. You have to, you have to go out in the desert and look. You know? Now, another thing that we've talked about that we haven't done yet, um, and I brought up even early on in my involvement with OKD, is we need a list of who has what resources for testing and building and whatnot. Um, so I think the docs group, I'll add that to the agenda for the docs group for the next meeting. Just so we get a sense of the membership of the OKD working group and surrounding community, what can people contribute in terms of infrastructure for testing, building, et cetera? Like I've got, you know, vSphere access. Um, someone might have, you know, Alibaba, someone might have, you know, whatever. Like the more that we can test across um, the platforms, and, and do builds on different infrastructure, I think the stronger will be to contribute, right? And, if Red Hat wanted to donate be, AWS, that would be uh, AWS resources. I'd be happy to test AWS, but I can't pay for it on my own hook. Right, and, and uh, <laughs> well, so I, here's the thing. I did AWS, uh, a basic OKD to an AWS. Mm -hmm. It ran about 300 and, Forty dollars a month to run it. It was it was not cheap because you figure you've got mm -hmm. your worker nodes, uh, and your your you know so it's 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 it can be kind of expensive. We yeah. might be able to come up with some way of a couple of companies contribute every month, or we develop. I'm actually involved in a lot of community groups that take contributions to do various types of work in my other hands. But for, for this, I mean, it wouldn't be running it all the time. It'd be more like, okay, can we build and test right. and do the basics work? Can we test a particular issue and then fix that issue and then turn it over to Prow for, for initial exactly. you know, for regular testing? Yeah, well, exactly. You know, like it doesn't always have to be testing on those specific clouds. Like if it's an AWS problem, yeah, you're not gonna be able to solve it without testing on AWS. Yeah. But when I think about what's going on with the Operate First community, uh, that's coming out of like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and Red Hat has a bunch of inroads in with it. We're deploying like OpenStack instances that are community operated. And I've mm -hmm. talked with this with the Operate First people, but you know, there's the notion that the OKD community could link up with the Operate First community and utilize something like their public open stack to run you know ci infrastructure that deploys openshift using the open stack provider for one but then you could also do vsphere installations on top of open stack you know assuming you could you could handle the nested virtualization or whatever but you can see what i'm getting at here like it doesn't always have to be aws gcp alibaba whatever like right. as a community, we might decide to choose to use OpenStack because it's also a community project that we have good you know, coverage on and we have people who can operate it. We link up with the Operate First community, figure out a way for us to like have administrators who could maintain our infrastructure, you know, and then OKD could actually be doing like testing and CI on mm -hmm. their own inside of a public cloud Sure. You know, and I think that really gets to kind of the, the crunchy granola side of the open source, which is like, you know, we're collaborating with others and using shared infrastructure to do these things. And like, for me, that would be like an ultimate kind of milestone to reach. I, it would be tough to do, but, you know, very cool. Well, just the reason I say AWS and GCP is that those are the, uh, those are the, the uh, stopping points right now for future releases, because that's where we're having the issues. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, no, 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 what you say makes perfect sense. Yeah, you know, well, if, we might you know. be able to do AWS. I mean, I'd have to map it out with like, mm -hmm. 
you know, um, anyway, it's, it's, it's possible, right? And it's possible, I think, if, if we got the community, everyone chips in, you know, $5 a month or something like that, like, you never know. There's, no, I'm, I mean, and I'm serious. Like, there's, there's, there's mm -hmm. a myriad of ways in which we could, like, fund well, right. or get donated stuff. Like, okay. let's not limit ourselves in any way, right? Right, but, like, if, if, see if they would support it. But like, for example, if let's say John is like working for a company that's using OKD or John owns a company that uses OKD and, and they happen to be using AWS and they're hitting this issue, then it's like, okay, if you fix the issue on your own deployment and then take it back to propose the code change upstream and we're using at that point the community infrastructure or Red Hat's infrastructure, then like I would expect as long as the tests pass on the CI at that point, I wouldn't necessarily need the OKD community to have their own, like, you know, AWS infrastructure. I mean, that may be the way it works in the end, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, the, the organization I work for does have OKD and AWS and um, OKD and vSphere. Um, but we need to document who has what and who has access mm -hmm. to what to be able to know what we have. So I think that's the first step. All right. I want to be mindful of people's time. It's three minutes after the hour. Thank you so much for this awesome discussion. We'll pick it up at the next meeting. There'll be a lot of stuff happening in between, so please check the mailing list. Uh, and the, oh, Matrix. I was able to get into Matrix. Other folks have um, as well. So the, they fixed an issue where the room wasn't visible. Uh, now it's visible. If, you just, if you're in the Matrix server, you can now find the room. Um, so anyone that hasn't gotten into it, just shoot a message to me, and I'll help you get into it. Um, cause it seems like we might be having some conversation. Any last minute thoughts before I end the meeting? I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks for the excellent discussion folks. This was great. Um, look for the video and look for discussion in between. Talk to you soon.